GDP per capita shows that we have entered a period of stagnation. Our lives just don't improve the way they used to. But that's probably dead wrong. Because GDP is great at measuring the output of wheat and steel, but it's terrible at capturing human wealth creation based on ideas and information, or improvements in quality, variety and comfort. How do you measure something that's for free? When people saved money for years to buy encyclopedia in the past, that showed up as wealth in GDP statistics. Now that it's available for free online, it's suddenly invisible. So one way of measuring the consumer surplus is to ask people if this service or technology was suddenly gone, how much would you pay to get it back in your life? Joel Moker, the economic historian, asks us to consider anesthesia. If there was no way of reducing pain, what would you pay for anesthesia? Well, it barely shows up in GDP statistics, but if you ask someone when they're about to go into surgery, he'd probably be willing to pay something that approaches his total wealth. And consider the internet. Almost no one would give up the internet for a million dollars. In fact, one study showed that a third would rather give up sex than give up the internet, which I think it's fair to say shows that it definitely underestimates its contribution to our well-being. You know, I like trade as much as the other guy, but especially I like exports. And to make exports great again, we need export subsidies. No, we don't. That's dead wrong. The whole point of trade is that no deal ever happens unless both sides think it's mutually beneficial, more so than any other deal would be. If that's not the case, well, then they find better uses for the resources. If the government steps in and subsidizes some exports, they divert trade away from that, away from the consumer preference, and the taxpayers have to pay for it. Politicians like Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton claim that America needs the Export-Import Bank to help small businesses to export. But that's not really what it does. The big bucks are being sent to big businesses with great political clout. In 2012, 83% of all the guarantees went to the exports of a single company, Boeing. And it just so happens that Boeing's CEO had recently been named the chairman of the President's Export Council, and it just so happens that his advice to the President was to spend generously on export subsidies. So at least it makes some people happy. And that includes other countries, because when we export to them now, we subsidize their consumption. In 2016, San Diego started raising the minimum wage. At last, relief for low-wage earners. No, not really. That's dead wrong. Because the results are in and wages are up, but jobs are down. The food industry is especially vulnerable because many people work there on minimum wages. And one year after the increase, San Diego has 4,000 fewer food service jobs than it otherwise would have. Yes, we've raised the menu prices. Yes, we are going to raise them again, said one restaurant owner who had to fire 13 employees. Some people see their paycheck increase, but others see them drop to zero. And as economist Lynn Reeser concludes, they are the most vulnerable, the unskilled, the uneducated, people with any kind of criminal record. That's disastrous, because these are often the first jobs people get, where they can learn how to behave in a workplace, where they can pick up the skills so that they can move on to better jobs afterwards. But of course, some people have benefited, especially the producers of robots, of self-ordering kiosks and automated baristas. The famine in Africa is now so severe that the United Nations talks about the worst humanitarian crisis in the organization's history since 1945. So nothing has been done against world hunger for more than 70 years? Dead wrong. It's bad now, but it used to be much worse. In the 1940s, 50s and 60s, between 15 million and 20 million people died in famines every decade. And during the first 10 years of the 20th century, World hunger killed every 70th person on the planet. Then came modern farm technologies, artificial fertilizer, better crops, and above all, Norman Borlaug, 
the agronomist from Iowa who fought tirelessly to introduce high-yielding wheat in countries like Mexico, India and Pakistan. It has been said that Borlaug saved more lives than any other human being ever. Since the United Nations was founded in 1945, the number of people who face food insecurity has been reduced from every second person on the planet to a bit more than one out of ten. But in some African countries, governments and terrorist groups destroy farms and trade because they want to hurt their opponents. So the problem is not a food deficit, but a surplus of force, war and terror. We live in a time of extraordinary inequality. Bill Gates is millions of times richer than the man on the street. The super-rich have left the rest of us far behind. Dead wrong. Sure, Bill Gates is 10 million times richer than I am, but is he really 10 million times better off than I am? Forget about dollars and cents for a moment and think about all the things that make for a good life. Yes, Bill Gates can travel by private jet, but the middle class can travel internationally nowadays as well. And on that plane, he probably eats similar food to what we eat. He might even use the same computer, the same cell phone as you and I. And he doesn't have 10 million times better access to the world's knowledge or entertainment. Our kids don't have a much smaller chance of being able to read and write, have access to food and safe water, and lead a long life. All that money cannot buy Bill Gates a much longer lifespan. In fact, all the things that make for a good life are now much more equally distributed than they have ever been. And one of the reasons is that some people like Bill Gates could make tons of money by making all these technologies and services much, much cheaper and so accessible to all of us. They took our jobs, the Chinese. One of quoted study showed that the US lost 2.4 million manufacturing jobs in 12 years. The Chinese took our jobs and destroyed our economy. Dead wrong. Sure, 2.4 million jobs in 12 years sounds like a lot. But you know what? The US economy loses almost 5 million jobs every month. And who created most of those jobs? The answer might surprise you. The companies most exposed to Chinese competition. Sure, they lost some jobs, but they also created more new jobs in the areas where China is less competitive. And they could expand production because they use cheaper inputs imported from China. One recent study showed that firms exposed to China expanded employment by 2% more per year than other firms. Critics say it's not the same jobs, and that's true. These jobs are better. Manufacturing jobs that pay higher wages because they're in areas where America is more competitive. And it's also service jobs that are complementary to high-tech manufacturing, like engineering, research and development and design. So sure, they took our jobs but they gave us better jobs in return. And you took my job! <gasps> they took our jobs! They took our jobs! They took our jobs! They took your job! I know, shh! Oh man, they took your job! They took your job! Animal control came and got him! Gosh, I'm sorry I'm late. I had to wait hours for a normal cab since I don't use Uber. Sure, Uber would have been more convenient, but I'm a considerate person. I think about the costs I impose on society. <sighs> Dead wrong. Car hailing apps like Uber actually reduce the negative externalities associated with car transportation. For example, it has been shown that it reduces traffic congestion in urban areas. Why? Well, for many reasons. The software directs the driver to the right place at the right time, so they don't have to drive around for a long time searching for customers. And as fewer people use their own car, they don't have to drive around in search for a parking lot. 
Car sharing also often results in more than one person per car. And this strategy with price surging at peak hours divert people away from the moments when there are most cars out on the roads. So it's good in so many ways. And since I lose less time searching for a cab when I use Uber, I can stay here longer, giving you more arguments. It reduces commuter stress. It, um, it reduces carbon dioxide emissions. And um, I don't have to own, and own a car of my own. I can just sit here waiting. I, I'm not in a rush anymore. The United Nations Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs, were a tremendous success. So now we need more big projects like that. Sustainable Development Goals financed by massive foreign aid. Dead wrong. The improvement when it comes to poverty, child mortality and schooling did not come in gift boxes from rich countries. It was homegrown. One study tried to find out the direct effect of the MDG goals by looking at how the indicators improved before September 2000 and after September 2000 when they were agreed upon. And it turned out that most of these indicators did not experience an acceleration after 2000. The improvement that took place had already begun in the same way between 1990 and 2000. Instead, most of this was the result of economic growth and local step-by-step -step improvements. Some of the countries that made the most progress, like China, didn't receive any foreign aid and they didn't care much about the Millennium Development Goals. So, for those who believe that development can only come from the top and from abroad, this must be the immaculate conception of progress. Yes, yes, we hear from people like Joe and Norberg that extreme poverty has declined more in the last few years than ever before. But those people only just made it above the poverty threshold. And they're much closer to extreme poverty than to middle income. They could just as easily slip back. Dead wrong. Progress has been even greater than that. Pew Institute took a close examination of the years 2001 to 2011. And during those 10 years, 669 million people rose out of extreme poverty defined as $2 a day. Meanwhile, slightly more than half of that number, 386 million people, rose above the level defined as middle income, between $10 a day and $20 a day. So the global middle income population almost doubled in just 10 years. And that's incredibly important because that's the level where historically and traditionally people can start to invest in their children's future and in their education and really begin to demand social reforms and democracy. And that is happening right now. The poor will not always be with us. The middle class will. We can't leave the nation's industrial future in the hands of chaotic market forces. As Britain's Prime Minister Theresa May puts it, the government should stop stepping back and start stepping up and take an active role in supporting industry. Dead wrong. Industrial policy is rarely a way of picking winners. It's a way of picking losers. If it were so obvious which industries would succeed in the future, they would have found plenty of capital on the free market anyway. There is a theoretical case that the markets miss potential, of course, but the fact that an omniscient being could find those cases doesn't mean that Theresa May or Donald Trump would. That process is always distorted by political opportunism and lobbying and creates an incentive for firms to invest in lobbying rather than in research and development. It doesn't help future winners, it helps struggling incumbents. An OECD study shows that an increase in the share of such zombie firms in a country's economy by 3.5% reduces that country's labour productivity by 1.2%. As the economic historian Eli Heckscher put it, either a company is viable and then it doesn't need government support, or it's not viable and then it doesn't deserve government support. People here, people there, people everywhere 
World population is growing exponentially, and so does resource consumption. This will end in tears. Dead wrong. As the recently deceased and sadly missed Professor of International Health, Hans Rosling, persistently reminded us, the world does not look like it did when we grew up. Economic reforms, better education, better technologies, they've all contributed to a rapid modernization around the world. And child mortality has declined dramatically. Now, children usually bury their parents rather than the other way around. And as more children survive, parents get fewer of them and instead invest more time and energy and resources in each of them. Since 1950, the number of children per woman in East Asia declined from 5.6 to 1.6, and in South Asia from 6 to 2.6. In Latin America, it declined from 5.9 to 2.2. Even in Africa, birth rates are coming down. Today, there are around 2 billion children in the world. According to present trends, in 2100, there will also be 2 billion children in the world. As the ever-eloquent Hans Rosling pointed out, mankind has reached peak children. We need protectionism to stop foreign industries, because they destroy our jobs. Shouldn't you be willing to pay a little bit more for the goods in order to save local jobs? Dead wrong. The problem with this idea is that we've tried it again and again, and it's failed every time. President George W. Bush implemented tariffs against Chinese steel to save a few jobs in the US steel industry. But more workers use steel than produce steel. So one study estimated that 200,000 Americans lost their jobs because of the steel tariffs in 2002. More people than worked in the entire steel industry itself. This did not deter President Obama from implementing tariffs against Chinese tires, which saved possibly 1,200 jobs in the US tire industry. But it came at a cost of $900,000 per job saved. And that was a price that consumers had to pay. So they could not use those money to buy goods from other US industries anymore. And it's been estimated that 4,000 people lost their jobs in those industries as a result of this tariff. And this, of course, was before America lost even more jobs because of retaliatory tariffs from the Chinese. So, trying to save jobs by limiting competition and consumer choice turns out to destroy even more jobs. Fake news swung the US election. We must stop it. Perhaps we should even limit free speech to combat it, as the Swedish Minister for Culture has suggested. Dead wrong. As Thomas Jefferson put it, it is error alone that needs government support. Truth can stand by itself. There was a time when fake news actually meant something more than anything I don't agree with. It was a story that was fabricated to hurt your opponent or to attract clicks to your website. And there were many stories like that in the US campaign. From the fiction of uh, how the Clintons ran a child sex ring from a pizza shop, to the articles about how Trump was endorsed by the Pope. But two researchers recently took a close study of those fake stories to see their real impact. And they concluded that they must have been incredibly convincing in order to have decided the outcome of the election. In fact, such articles would have had to be 36 times more persuasive than a TV ad. Other factors were much more important, like the Russian hacking of the Democrats' email. So the idea that fake news is taking over turns out to be fake news. You elitists, you globalists, you have no sense of the human cost of the policies you implement. Your free trade killed the American Rust Belt. Dead wrong. Most jobs were lost there between 1950 and 1980, before globalization really got going. The death of Rust Belt manufacturing was an inside job. And big business and big labor were not the victims, they were the killers. 
After the Second World War, the big producers of steel, of cars and tires faced little competition, so they didn't see the need to innovate and become more productive. The only pressure they felt were from trade unions. Southeastern states they had right-to-work laws in place since the 1950s, which limited the power of trade unions. The Rust Belt didn't, so trade unions could bid up the price of labor. The average worker in the Rust Belt had a wage that was 13% higher than a similar worker in other states. So they had the best jobs on the planet a little, little while, because in the long run consumers do not prefer more expensive products that are more outdated than the alternatives. Far from being an example of the impact of trade and competition, the Rust Belt is a warning of what happens when you ignore trade and competition. Jeremy Corbyn of the British Labour Party wants a new kind of democratic socialism, with majority decisions controlling local communities, services and workplaces. Isn't that neat? People power. Democratic harmony. Dead wrong. The model for this reform is the direct democracy in Corbyn's own campaign organisation, Momentum. But incidentally, Momentum is right now being torn apart because of this. The leadership wants online voting to guide the organisation, but the opposition in Momentum thinks that that creates unaccountable leaders, so they prefer local groups to make those democratic decisions. The leadership thinks that that would only benefit infiltrators and people who want to spend hours in dull meetings. So a civil war is right now raging in momentum, with the factions calling one another the splitters and wreckers, Stalinists and even right-wingers. So a decision model that's supposed to control everything that's important – local communities, workplaces, energy, housing – did not even work to organise the group that want to implement it. You can't have free markets and strategic resources. As Paul Krugman warned us, free trade made us dependent on China for rare earth minerals, necessary in almost all high-tech gizmos. So it was a disaster when China restricted exports in 2010. Dead wrong. As long as markets are free, higher prices on a resource gives people incentives to find more of it or substitutes. So when China restricted exports and prices surged, New mines were opened in the US, in Japan, Australia and other places. Metal companies started recycling these minerals from industrial waste. So suddenly rare earth minerals weren't that rare anymore. And China's share of the world market declined from 97% to 70%. Companies also started developing technologies that used less of them or none at all. Recently, Honda presented a hybrid car engine that didn't use any heavy rare earth minerals at all. It was also lighter and cheaper. Paul Krugman warned us that China's monopoly would give it the power of destruction. But the only thing that China destroyed was its own industry. Trade is dependent on long-distance transportation, and transportation results in carbon dioxide emissions. It's difficult to buy all things locally, like an Apple computer for example. But couldn't we at least buy these apples locally to save the planet? Dead wrong. In the debate about food miles we tend to forget that the largest environmental footprint is not made by distance, but by production. The production phase is responsible for 83% of the carbon dioxide in the average American household's food consumption. All transportation combined is responsible for no more than 11%. This means that it might be better to produce things where we need less resources and less energy and then ship them to the places where we want to consume them. For example, because there are places with a better climate or a better growing season so that we don't have to grow things in greenhouses. One study even showed that it's better for the planet to produce apples in New Zealand and ship them all the way to Britain than to produce them locally. Once upon a time we had secure, unionized jobs and employers who cared about our job satisfaction. Now more of us have to take whatever we can get in the gig economy. 
lonely, exploited and exhausted and dead wrong. As a freelancer myself, I can say that most of us who work independently do that because we prefer that to a traditional 9 to 5 job. McKinsey has surveyed people who have become independent workers with the help of digital platforms like Uber, Airbnb and Etsy. It showed that the great majority, between 70 and 75%, did that actively. They sought those arrangements because they wanted to be their own boss. And contrary to myth, they also report higher job satisfaction than people in traditional jobs. Not just in terms of freedom and creativity, but also in terms of activities performed and hours worked. Granted, there is a sizable minority in the gig economy who would want a traditional job. But you know what? One in six people in traditional jobs would prefer to be in the gig economy. The cubicle can also be a prison. And now for something completely different. Pornography. Because of the internet it's now available to everybody all the time. And that's dangerous because porn promotes sexism and results in more sexual crime. Dead wrong. Recent research shows that moderate pornography consumption does not harm relationships or make users more aggressive. In fact, some researchers claim that exposure to pornography might make men less likely to commit sexual crime. Countries that liberalized their pornography laws saw a reduction in reported rape. And so did the American states with the most widespread access to the internet. Some claim that pornography is getting more violent and that there is adaptation going on. The more access you have, the more you adapt to the most brutal and beastly stuff. But that's based on anecdotal evidence. When you scan all the pornographic searches on the internet, you notice that truly violent pornography is extremely rare and there is almost no adaptation. Almost everybody search for the same things over and over again. Not convinced? Go look for yourself. I won't tell. Everybody loves infrastructure spending. It's big. It's beautiful. It creates jobs and growth. It's win-win. It's shovel-ready. Let's start building. Dead wrong. Big infrastructure plans are often bridges to nowhere because political pressure misallocates investments and 9 out of 10 of these projects experience cost overruns. The infrastructure expert Bent Fleberg has formulated the iron law of mega projects. They are over budget, over time, over and over again. In fact, the least deserving projects get built precisely because the estimates are overly optimistic. Assumptions about job creation are also exaggerated. Even if you accept that Obama's stimulus program created 3 million jobs, they came at a cost of some $400,000 each. Well, if you take $400,000 from the private sector and create one job, you will look very energetic. That is what is seen. What is not seen are all the jobs that money would have created if the government didn't take it. So sure, if you really need it, build it. But it's not a cure-all. Remember, the road to hell is paved with good intentions and tax dollars. If some countries don't tax their carbon dioxide emissions, their dirty production will outcompete our greener industries. So we need climate tariffs on imports, so that all the products pay for the pollution at the border. Dead wrong. We don't know all about the emissions in our own country. So how could we possibly calculate the emissions from every product in every factory on the other side of the planet? It would be a completely arbitrary exercise. And the problem is that arbitrary is often synonymous with corrupt. This would be a bonanza for powerful domestic companies who want to punish products who just happens to compete with them. And wouldn't it be a nightmare to try and reach some sort of international agreement on this? When China and the US tried to come up with a common approach, the Chinese wanted to include how workers get to the factory in the morning, because the Chinese often take the bike. So it wouldn't work. But what's more, it wouldn't help.
Just 1% of the electricity generation in a country like the United States is related to exports. Even if we got rid of all of that, it wouldn't make a difference. So using trade to save the climate wouldn't save the climate, it would just hurt trade. Our ancestors produced everything they needed themselves, whereas we consume things we don't even understand how they're created. Division of labor has resulted in an absurd, alienated world. Wouldn't self-sufficiency be more natural? Dead wrong. If you think a world without trade would be better, Andy George has an experiment for you. He wanted to produce something as simple as a chicken sandwich from scratch, all by himself. So he harvested and ground wheat to produce flour. He grew his own vegetables. He milked a cow for butter. And he made his own salt from ocean water. Then he found a chicken and killed it. This was all horribly difficult and time consuming. Even though he cheated, he didn't produce his own vehicles to travel by or the fuels that they needed. He didn't produce his own tools or the steel or plastic that they were made of. Even so, it all cost him $1,500 for a sandwich that he described as not bad. A sandwich that he could have bought around the corner for $1.50. Modern civilization is possible because of the magic of division of labor and specialization. As long as trade is free, we can benefit from knowledge that we don't have about how to produce all these things in the best possible way. And you know what? It took Andy six months to create one sandwich. Without free trade, he would have starved by then, just like people used to do before free trade. There are differences in intelligence between nations and groups, and they are based on genetic differences. Just look at the gap in IQ scores between ethnic groups in America. Dead wrong. Intelligence is not fixed. Researchers have documented a rapid increase in IQ scores for almost every group in almost every nation after the Second World War. This so-called Flynn effect is the result of a complex combination of factors in modern society from better nutrition and education to more use of technology and a more challenging popular culture. Yes, really. Therefore, it's not strange that privileged groups who got access to this first had a head start, but other groups catch up as they modernize. 100 years ago, Italian and Polish immigrants to the United States registered 15 points lower on IQ scores than the average. But 50 years later, the Italians had caught up, and the Poles had passed the average by 9 IQ points. So, if you think that those gaps are given, you're not particularly smart. But don't worry, it's not genetically determined. You can evolve. Go read a book. We live in an era of unique inequality. In countries and between countries, we are being torn apart by globalization and free markets. No, no, no. That's dead wrong. The biggest inequality in the world is that most of your income still depends on where you happen to be born. But in this era of globalization, the world's poor have finally been given the chance to participate. And global poverty has been reduced by three quarters in 25 years. As a result of that, inequality is starting to come down. The traditional way of measuring inequality is the Gini coefficient, from 0 to 1, where 0 would mean that everybody makes the same, and 1 would mean that one individual gets everything. After having increased since it was invented, the Gini coefficient started to come down around the turn of the century, from 0.69 in 2003 to 0. 0.65 in 2013, and if present trends continue, then it'll come down to 0.61 in 20 years' time. This might not sound much, but it means that global inequality is being reduced for the first time since the Industrial Revolution because of globalization and free markets. It's stupid trade. 
It's ruining our industries and our jobs. It's killing us. So bring on the tariffs to save the jobs. Dead wrong. Between 2000 and 2010, almost 6 million US manufacturing jobs were lost. But that was not because cheap imports hurt those industries. On the contrary, those industries produced more than they ever had. So much more that if the US would have kept its level of productivity of the year 2000 and applied it to 2010 levels of production, the US would have increased its number of factory workers by 3 million. But productivity, of course, did not stay the same. It increased rapidly, mostly because of automation. Have you been to a factory lately? It's not 100 men with wrenches anymore. It's more like five guys with computers. 88% of all the manufacturing jobs that were lost were lost due to increased productivity, not international trade. So even if we kept the factories, we wouldn't keep those factory jobs. Hence the joke about the factory in the future, which will have only two employees, a man and a dog. The man will be there to feed the dog. The dog will be there to keep the man from touching the equipment. Trade is important, so we need more trade agreements between countries. Actually, that's dead wrong. We need more trade, but do we really need more trade agreements? Over the last 20 years, we have signed almost four times more regional trade agreements than over the 50 years before. And yet, trade has grown slower over this period. One reason is that these trade agreements come with complicated rules of origins and preferential treatments. And since every product contains components from tons of different countries, the result is overlapping and costly rules. The trade economist Jagdish Bhagwati has likened this resulting crisscrossing of tariffs and barriers to a bowl of spaghetti. You can't untangle this. We don't have to swallow this bureaucracy. We can have world trade agreements where every country treats the others the same. Or even better, we can unilaterally abolish all these tariffs that hurt us so much. If other countries deny themselves the freedom to choose from a bigger menu, then it's not retaliation if you do the same. It's just a way to spoil your dinner. It's just a